Greetings fellow Earthlings, this is a Pontiac GTO. Just saying the word makes me feel cooler. 1964 was the very first year of the Pontiac GTO and the GTO is considered by many to be the very first American muscle car and that's why they call it the GOAT. Not everybody agrees on why the Pontiac GTO is called the GOAT. Is it because it's the greatest of all time? Or is it because goats eat anything, like Mustangs and Impalas and Barracudas and such? Or is it because it's a gas, tire and oil burner? Perhaps you could tell me in the comments what you think. Uh, no matter what, the advertising team at Pontiac tried desperately to get people to call this car the Tiger or the Humbler or the great one, but in the end, even they gave up and just started calling it the GOAT. This car is a 1964 Pontiac Le Mans GTO convertible. Now, some of you may be screaming at the screen at how I pronounce that word, uh, but this is America. How would you pronounce that word? In America, you just pronounce all the letters, Le Mans, and you pretend that the country of France just doesn't exist. Later on, the GTO did become its own model, but in 1964, when the GTO first came out, it was just an options package. And a lot of the reason why we know the name John DeLorean and the GTO comes down to a clever loophole that John and his team exploited to get this car made. Back in the early 60s, John DeLorean and his small team at Pontiac were hoping to position themselves as General Motors racing division. And at the time, they were getting ready to release the 1964 Pontiac Le Mans, which had the racy GTO model. Unfortunately, though, that also coincided with General Motors having a company-wide racing ban that also included banning the use of their larger engines in their smaller cars. Not to be thwarted though, John and his team decided that what they would try to do is just offer the GTO package as a little checkbox that customers could select in the dealership if they wanted it. And they were right. Enough customers ordered that option that by the time the upper management noticed that they were doing this little trickery, the car was a hit and all was forgiven and John was promoted. Let's take a look at the inside of this GTO. First thing you might notice here in the back is we've got wind up windows, not only in the front, but in the back as well. Also in the back, you get an ashtray either side, kind of a sign of the times. There's no cup holders, but three ashtrays. Uh, opening up the door here, it is heavy, as you might expect. In the door, the door handle is very much the same as on the uh, 356. And of course, a little wind up window there. A lot of them have this motif on them which is kind of like the Pontiac logo which is kind of cool it's repeated on the door here as well these like parallel lines it has the air conditioning system like the um, 356 has as well uh, seat belts in the 60s were not mandatory so this does have lap belts just for fun and uh, the ignition system is just these simple keys the tiny little boring key is the one that does the magic with the ignition let's look at some of the switches down here this guy, we're trying to figure out what it does. We think that opens the vent for your uh, feet air. Uh, down the bottom here, that switch goes between dips and headlights, something you don't see anymore, but very common back in the day. That's for your uh, parking brake, and that's your parking brake release. That is to turn on your hazard lights, if you get in trouble. Uh, this button uh, puts the top up and down. It's electric, it's fairly quick. You just undo a couple of clips kind of like a modern car, uh, not really much different. This here is our headlights. 
Uh, you can turn the dial to um, increase the interior illumination. This guy here with a little nipple on it is for the wipers. A couple of speeds on the wipers there. Down the bottom we have our disc brakes. It reminds us that this car has the disc brake option, even though you could use an extra person to help you press the pedal, they should come with that. And we have our Pontiac logo and our horn. Uh, inside here, we have uh, no rev counter, oddly enough. That was fairly rare back in the 60s. And this car originally had an automatic gearbox, and so it doesn't have the rev counter. Uh, we do get uh, battery level, oil pressure, of course, speedo is probably a good idea. Gasoline, which we have used a tremendous amount of that gasoline already today, even though we haven't been driving particularly hard. Uh, temperature, the rally clock, which was an option at the time. This here is a little switch that puts the antenna up and down for the radio. This is for the um, AC system or the um, heat system, really. There's no AC. And so let's turn some power on here and see if we can get that guy to run. There we go, you can kind of hear it. It's like a, an asthmatic dog. Um, it will make some sort of a difference, I'm sure. Maybe if you're a cold, there's no AC. You can get de-ice, you can make it warmer. There's off, slightly more than off. Maybe it's on, and then I can just about hear it. Those are the levels. Um, down the bottom here, this is the ashtray for all those cigarettes you're gonna smoke. That's the ashtray that I can't get open. I think it's the ashtray, I can't get it open. That's the radio that, you know, does radio stuff. Doesn't actually make any sound for music. In the center here, we have the uh, vacuum manifold gauge, which is a early economy meter. It's uh, monitoring the vacuum off the engine. And if that uh, goes up, you're gonna be uh, putting your foot on the gas and not getting very good gas mileage, that's for sure. Another use for that is if you're used to it, let's start it up here. Also, it has carburetors and you can tell sometimes. It's pretty, pretty much starts on the key first time, but not always. So you can see here, if you were used to driving this car every day and this gauge ended up uh, going into the power section when you were uh, just idling, then that might be a sign that something wasn't going very well with the engine. And see if I give it gas, there it goes into power. And uh, that's really all that does. Um, over here we do have the glove compartment, the gear shifter. We've got the reverse lockout type thing there. There's reverse down to low. Originally this car had the two-speed power glide transmission. It has been updated to the three-speed now. So you've got first gear and then the other ones. And that's pretty much it. Let's take a look. Oh, cock, I forgot this. It does have a center console. And inside there we have this vintage map, which is kind of cool. What's a map, you millennials may be asking. We just spent the last few minutes trying to figure out the logic puzzle that is the hood release on this Pontiac GTO. Let me save you some trouble and show you where it is. So it's a two-parter. We've got one down here that I can never seem to find. There we go. Let me push that up and then just pull that latch in front of you out of the way. And that's it. This is the heart of the beast. That is the 389 cubic inch V8, uh, 6.4 liters to our European friends. There is so much space in here because it's a very simple setup. We do have an alternator. Uh, we do have a power steering pump, a battery, of course. We have the uh, brake master cylinder there. And that's basically it, other than these chrome items. On the GTO, you get uh, chrome valve covers. Then you also get this tri-power setup, which as the name suggests, is these three carburetors three double barrel carburetors. And on the Porsche 356 that we have on the channel, that has one dual carburetor either side. So one Venturi for each of the four cylinders. On this, we've got six Venturi going into a V8 engine, which seems a little weird. That's 2.66 cylinders per carburetor, but it's really quite a clever setup. The center carburetor is the one that's running all the time. When you start the car, when you're driving around, really that's all that's happening. 
but then when you give it some gas, 75% of the uh, accelerator, though you can adjust that, then these outside ones come on and you can really feel the difference and hear the difference. It's almost like uh, the turbo just kicked in. And that is the tri-power that everybody talks about. And back in the 60s, that was pretty modern technology. The carburetors available at the time, you could get a dual carburetor or a four barrel carburetor. And the whole point was to try to get as much air into the engine as possible uh, so you can generate some power. And back in the day, a uh, tri-power could get more air into the engine than a four-barreled carburetor at the time. And so that's really it. That's your tri-power. These days, uh, they have many better ways of achieving that, though it certainly looks cool and it certainly sounds cool. No tri-power. Tri-power. No tri-power. Tri-power. Let's take a minute to talk about prices. I happen to have the original sales invoice for this car from back in 1964. Uh, it sold in Santa Ana, California, which is just up the road from here. It shows that it was manufactured in Fremont, California, which is one of the Pontiac plants at the time. Uh, it says it's model 2267 Le Mans convertible. The original basic price was $2,785, which the conversion between 1964 and today is pretty easy. Just add a zero. And so that $2,785 is about $28,000 in today's money. And um, what it says here as well is the following items, options or accessories, or some are on some other models are uh, optional, but they're standard on this car. And that's the power operated top, the steering wheel with the deluxe ring, that's that wood, uh, dual horns, uh, courtesy lamps and bucket seats in the front instead of the bench seat. This is one of the first cars that came with the sporty bucket seats that ended up with this center console. Um, additionally, we see here, oh, the push button radio for one, two, three, four, five buttons. That would cost you $62.41 in 1964. So over $600 for a radio. Um, and then this does have disc brakes uh, in the front only. And two disc brakes are $15.60 back in 1964. And so all of that, when you're all said and done, this car out the door is about $3,000. So about $34,000 in today's money. Now we talked in a previous video about how much the Porsche 356 would have cost in 1964. And it was around $8,000 or $80,000 in today's money, which at the time that was the same price as a Corvette C2. And so you can see just how good value uh, one of these GTOs was back in the day. And 1964 was also the first year of the Ford Mustang. And the Ford Mustang was even cheaper than this, around $2,800. And while this car was very popular, it was created a storm in 1964 and sold over 35,000 examples in that one year. To give you an idea of how popular the Mustang was, they sold over 20,000 Mustangs on the first day that it was available for sale. Anyway, on this car, the GTO package was just an options package. You could just order it and pay the extra and it would come with all the extra stuff. And that was $290, or about $3,000 in today's money. So what do you get in 1964 in your GTO options package? Well, of course, there is a bit of badge engineering going on. Any of you folks who like to bet can put your number in the comment section right now. Let's count up all the GTO badges on this car. Get set, go! One, two, three, four, five, what are you doing? six, seven. Uh, 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 uh. Besides the badges, of course, there is the imitation hood scoops, which look nice. Uh, they're imitation on the majority of GTOs. Uh, some of the later models did have ram air that would function out of those hood scoops. There is, of course, the very important part of this car, which is the engine. That 389 cubic inch, 6.4 litre V8 under the hood, which is dressed up with the chrome valve covers and that all-important tri-power carburetor setup. In addition to that, in the back you do get those twin uh, chrome side exhausts and we get the handling package that includes a different valving on the uh, shock absorbers to make them a little stiffer. And you know, for a big old American car, it doesn't feel that bad, it handles fairly well. 
Uh, and then also involved in that handling package is a seven bladed fan in the engine bay to help cope with all that heat. And so really there was quite a lot going on, uh, especially where it mattered in the power. Uh, perhaps some more in the braking could help. Uh, this does have the ultimate braking package, which is twin disc brakes in the front. But that's your GTO package. You just tick the box and that's what comes to you. Greetings fellow Earthlings and welcome to this tiny parking lot and a special welcome to subscriber and member Cameron Sims. I'm visiting friends in your hometown this Friday. Do you think you could pick me up? My flight number is Delta number two up. One cool benefit of having this GTO is you don't have to worry what side of the pump you park on. As long as you know where it is, it's right here in the middle. Kind of handy, really. I wish more rental cars would have that. Let's see how much it takes. So this car with that 389, which is a 6.4 liter engine, apparently it gets between 13 and 17 miles per gallon. But if you start using that tri-power, you're gonna put that into single digits. So we're gonna be doing this quite a lot today, I think. Little bit of tri power. I'd like to say a big thank you to Tom at Cardiff Classics in Encinitas, California, for lending us this piece of American history today. If you're interested in awesome classic cars and some modern performance cars, check out uh, Cardiff Classics online and there's details of them and this car in the description down below. So why is this car called a GTO? Well, any of you car fanatics out there will be familiar with the term GTO attached to a bunch of different Ferraris. And in 1964, John DeLorean was fairly enamored with the 250 GTO from Ferrari that today is worth multiple millions. And in Italian, the term GTO means Gran Turismo homologato. Roughly translated to English, that means Grand Touring homologated. And the term homologated means approved. And at the time, in 1964, the team at Pontiac did have the 1964 Pontiac GTO approved with the European racing body, the FIA. So it could be raced legally in Europe. So it really was a GTO. So what's you like to drive? Let's give it a go. Accelerating. So there's regular. I don't dare do tri power because we're coming up to a corner. It's kind of like having a turbo. Really, on the pedal, it feels like a kick down. Um, on an automatic, you know, you've got to like, eh, to press the button. It's very much like that. And uh, the steering, like a lot of American cars of this era, it is a little wibbly wobbly, a little vague around the center point. Nothing too horrendous, nothing shocking. And possibly that could be tightened up, who knows. Um, I think steering of that era was kind of like that. One thing I do want to demonstrate though is the turning circle. This is a good place. So you would think, hey, it's this big old boat, but well, then you try to do a turning circle situation and it's really, really good. I'm gonna like prove myself wrong and hit that curb. No, I didn't hit the curb. There, it's amazing. I wanna go around again. I won't go around again because that's ridiculous. But very good turning circle. And then here, I'll do some tri-power here. There's the tri-power. And you can chirp the tires going into second for sure. The other thing too, the suspension, uh, this does have the GTO suspension, which is slightly upgraded to be a, li a little bit stiffer. Um, but um, unlike a modern car, it's not gonna hug the corners. It's gonna try to go out on the corners. And what I've been trying to do, it's a different sort of feel. You've got to kind of use the weight of the car and, you know, if anything jumps out in front of you, God help you, uh, they will be red mist. Uh, but um, as long as everything goes okay, it's actually quite fun. And the power, so there's 300 and something, 348 horsepower, I would say for sure it feels at least that. 
This car weighs around 3,500 pounds and uh, that is not too chubby for uh, that amount of horsepower and it does, it does feel pretty good. Uh, on these twisties, I'd have to get pretty used to the car before I would trust it too much. And the big thing we have to mention, everyone gives us thumbs up, it's fantastic. Um, the brakes, oh my gosh, the brakes are borderline tragic. Uh, there's a, a famous YouTube video, I'm sure you guys have seen it, it's a guy, I'm not sure what his name is, but it's an old um, 60s car, it's a modern YouTube video, and he put 1300 horsepower into it. Uh, but forgot to put any money, it seems, into the brakes. And in the video, they end up coming up to a traffic light, not being able to stop. And the guy making the video ends up eating his own teeth on the dash. And this car is certainly not that bad, but you need to plan where you're going to be braking. Uh, even with those disc brakes, I feel like I could use both my feet on the brake pedal at times. And it seems to explain why the brake pedal is double wide because maybe you needed that back in the day. Um, but as long as you plan for it and the brakes are, they're decent. We spoke about how the GTO was born by virtue of bending the rules a little bit. Well, I have to admit, I've been bending the rules a little bit in this review because this is not a real Pontiac GTO. In 1964, this car left the factory as a Pontiac Le Mans convertible, which is just the same as all of the other 1964 Pontiac GTOs. They just had those additional parts installed afterwards. And so this car, when it was uh, restored 15 years ago, the owner spent $70,000 taking the entire car apart and putting it all back together again, but with all of the real GTO bits. So all of those badges, a, a 1964 numbers matching um, 389 cubic inch engine in there and all of the bits you need to make it a GTO. Now you might say, well what about the automatic transmission? Well in 1964 the GTO did come standard with a three speed manual and then a close ratio four speed was available as an option. But then at the same time, an extra cost option was the two-speed power glide automatic transmission. And so this car did have that transmission, but when it was restored, they updated it to have a three-speed auto to make it more usable on the highway. And of course, in today's society, a manual transmission is akin to an additional anti-theft device. And I do think the automatic transmission suits this car very well and makes it much more usable if you wanted to share it with your family and your friends and such. And the other thing too is you may feel heartbroken by this not being a real GTO, but if you look at the VIN, on a VIN you cannot tell the difference between a Pontiac Le Mans convertible and a GTO. Let's take a look at that. Taking a quick look at the VIN here, that first eight says that the engine in this car is a V8 but it doesn't tell you whether it's the standard 326 or the 389 that they put in the GTO. The next number, if it's a zero, that's a Tempest, like on the movie My Cousin Vinny. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. If it's a number one, it's a Tempest Custom. Is that it? No, there's more. And on this car, it has a two, which is a Tempest Le Mans, and that's what they made the GTOs out of. The number four means this car was made in 1964, then that letter F means it was made in Fremont, California. The last four numbers are the serial number for this individual car. So you can see the only way to know if this car really is a GTO is to call up the Pontiac people and tell them what you bought and did that leave the factory with the GTO package. And so this car, we've had such a great time driving it today. I have used the Tri-Power maybe more often than I should have. I'm, I'm very sorry. I did pay for the gas though, so I guess it's okay. Um, what you do get in this car though is a Pontiac GTO for all intents and purposes, as good or better than it left the factory, but for half the price of a real one in today's market. I'd like to say a big thank you to Tom 
at Cardiff Classics for trusting me with this piece of Americana today. We had a great time and if you're interested in this car, it is for sale and there's more information if you take a look in the description down below. And uh, unfortunately though, that is all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time. Try power! It's not that bad. <laughs> I lost my goat. I'm in a goat and I lost my goat. Where did it go? You're like this one show in Bluey. There it is. <laughs>